Good morning, everyone. Thank you. We have a fantastic panel this morning, and I just want to make a couple of very quick announcements about a couple of other things going on today. At lunch, we'll have some really interesting screenings uh, from uh, some classic uh, television program programs from Channel 4 in Britain. Rod Stoneman, who was at Channel 4, is going to show us some of those. And we're providing box lunches, and it's in this room. So come and uh, watch some television. At uh, what time? The final plenary is at 5.30, featuring Mr. Toby Miller, who just walked in, and a few others. And that is followed by a closing reception, and we will have door prizes. If you haven't put your name in the little little thing, uh, you're going to miss out. We got some fantastic door prizes, mostly books. Uh, but, you know, how much we love books. So thanks, and thanks to all of these uh, folks for, for joining us this morning. Vince Porter, who is the executive director of the Governor's Office for Film and Television here in Portland, is going to moderate this panel. And uh, Vince, it's all yours. Thanks, Janet. Can you hear me? Is this on? OK. Um, well, we have a great group of uh, panelists here. And I'm really thrilled to have both um, Patrick and Bill, um, who have been in the trenches of writing for television, and, and David, who has um, it's just uh, kind of almost begun his television career in the last few years from coming from features and commercials and then of course Nathaniel who has um, been a fantastic rep here for the actors um, in for representing AFTRA but um, why don't I just quickly uh, have everyone introduce themselves give them like a real short uh, introduction of what they've, what their experience has been, and th and then I know Patrick has a great little uh, ten minute spiel on, on on his experiences over the, over the many years. But start with Patrick. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Patrick Verone. I'm a, a television writer, uh, former president of the Writers Guild West, and uh, you'll hear more in my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Cresson. Um, uh, I started. Uh, I'm from Portland, and I started in um, commercials. Uh, and did that for a number of years and owned a, a, a small commercial production company. And then um, started doing uh, some music video work with Gus Van Zandt, and that led to a producing role with him, and I, I've worked on a few of his films. And uh, then uh, uh, through uh, the re really the relationship with Carrie Brownstein, an independent film, uh, I started working on Portlandia, and uh, we're hoping soon to embark on our third season. I'm Nathaniel Applefield. I serve as executive director of the Portland Local of the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. We represent actors, broadcasters, and recording artists. Um, been with AFTRA for about a year, and before that I spent a good seven years working in uh, campaign politics. Uh, I'm Bill Oakley. I currently work with David on Portlandia, where I'm a writer and consulting producer. Uh, Prior to that, I worked uh, with a partner, Josh Weinstein, for a number of years, and on uh, most notably on The Simpsons, where we were uh, writers, the head writers for a while, and executive producers. Uh, I've also done a lot of development, uh, TV pilots for all sorts of networks and so forth, and uh, I think that covers it. Great. So let's start with Patrick. Um, you know, with your experience uh, being the president of the Writers Guild, you, you certainly have had a lot of insight on, on the... Uh, present and future of, of tele television, because you've been in the trenches on all that. So let's... Yes, I do. Forward. And to make it seem more like a, a, a keynote speech that I flew from Los Angeles to give, I'm going to go over to the podium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where, where coincidentally, my, my, my notes are as well. So, um, all right, Patrick, I'll just shut the mic off. So, so the, first of all, let me just say that, of course, when you're talking about television, at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, to me that, of course, means Saturday morning cartoons. And, and when I was in school or in academia, no one was awake at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, much less attending any kind of academic panel. 
Um, now that I'm, I've been working in, in television for all these years, it's very clear that no one is up at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning um, presenting to an academic panel either. So, so this is a real rare treat for both us and for you, uh, I hope. We're supposed to speak about the changes and challenges in TV production. Um, I, I suspect that, that um, for me, the most uh, significant challenge and change has been um, the consolidation of media uh, over the course of, of my career. I've, I've been in TV for 25 years. <clears throat> I started when I was nine. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at how old you think I am. Um, I've written for Johnny Carson, Kermit the Frog, uh, Bart Simpson, Bender the Robot. In case you're wondering, next in the evolutionary cycle is Newt Gingrich. <laughs> President Newt Gingrich, all right, well, that may be good. Um, in 1988, there were uh, 29 dominant entertainment firms making about $100 billion in annual revenue. Today, there are six making about 400 billion. These are the global giants with whom you are all familiar, Sony, Time Warner, Disney, uh, CBS Viacom, News Corp, and the new kid on the block, Comcast, NBC, uh, Universal. Um, historically, the great challenge in television has actually been getting the stuff made. It's the show challenge in the show business uh, dynamic. Um, luckily, the media giants are of the firm opinion that, that, that content is king, so they've all been very um, inclined to make television, um, putting up the money, the barriers to entry that already exist that are enormous that would have for the years kept you or I or anybody from making television. They've always been very willing to do it. What's, what's largely changed, though, over the past generation is the, the business part of show business, which is how the challenge of making television becomes um, paying for television and making a living uh, as, as, uh, as talent in, in television. Um, I'll, let me throw a few more numbers at you. In, in 1989, um, when there were four broadcast networks, they made about 20%, they themselves, meaning their production arms, made about 20% of what aired on those networks. Um, today, they make over 70% of it in-house with their own production, um, cradle to grave ownership. Um, if you take out reality television, which I know there's a panel this, this morning that, so I won't go into the economics of it, but reality TV, which doesn't have any kind of back end, doesn't have um, um, reruns and, and, and the like, typically. If you take that out, it's almost 100% uh, of, of broadcast television that's made by the actual companies, the same companies that air it, that distribute it. And, and interestingly, despite the, the large amount of cable uh, television outlets, the actual amount of content produced by those same uh, six majors accounts for over 70% of what's on in... Uh, um, and cable. So, so the notion is contract, uh, co content is king, um, but you control the king and you control the kingdom. Um, and, and there's actually been a, a real leg up that Hollywood producers have in, in controlling uh, content, which is the notion in copyright law of a work, work for hire. Uh, playwrights, novelists have their own copyrights in television uh, that's not the case. Creators work under the copyright laws in the U.S., which, uh, um, despite the way Jefferson originally designed them, um, which was meant, Jefferson himself being a, a, uh, uh, an inventor, wanted to sort of incentivize creative people to create by giving them uh, a monopoly, an exclusive monopoly on their uh, what they created or invented or, or produced themselves for a limited period of time. The idea was you get an, got an agrarian nation at, uh, in the 1700s and, and you needed to incentivize that kind of uh, creativity. And, and so nevertheless, what happened in the, at the turn of the last century was the copyright laws developed for audiovisual content this notion of work for hire, 
which means that the, the business entity owns the copyright, not the individual person, the writer, director, the actor, who puts the sweat equity into the property. Um, and what the Work for Hire doctrine does is it, it, it moves the incentive from the artist or the creator um, to the, the corporate entity, who of course already have a pretty, um, a pretty big incentive, namely, namely profit. Um, that didn't make a lot of difference in the early days of media because movies didn't rerun. So you didn't care about the fact that once it was made, it showed in theaters and then it was done. And if it reran, the notion of a rerun didn't, didn't make any difference. So that changed about 60 years ago with the advent of, of, of broadcast television, where you actually suddenly had the ability to rerun not only motion pictures, but new content that, that, uh, um, that was made for television. That, at the time, was called the death knell of Hollywood. This was going to be the end of movies and, and audiovisual medium as we, as we know it. Obviously, it wasn't because the, the, the same entities that, that controlled movies moved into television and developed these new business models basically based on advertising. Um, and another thing called the aftermarket, which is that the fact that you could rerun movies and you could get a new revenue stream from their reuse on TV. They could be shown over and over and over again. Um, so, so, you know, that, that lasted with the limited shelf space of three networks for, another, for about 30 years until along comes cable. And cable television was designed to provide all these alternatives, not only for viewers, but also for the corporate entities themselves that would be competitive and challenging and put all kinds of different and interesting programming on. Um, um, and that was supposed to be the death knell of, of broadcast TV. Of course, that didn't happen because the same companies bought up all the cable outlets over time, and they were able to reuse the, the once limited shelf space of broadcast TV. They could now re rerun all their, their library uh, and archive TV shows on, uh, on cable with a whole new advert, not only advertising, but also subscriptions. So now there's two uh, revenue markets for, uh, for the product. Um, more aftermarket, much, much more shelf space. So then comes home video, uh, at the time video cassettes, now DVDs. The whole idea of time shifting and movement from a, a push media of, of, of certainly my youth where um, you wanted to watch television, you had a choice of three, maybe if you lived in, in a big market that had ten channels, you watched what was on, when it was on, when uh, Fred Silverman told you to watch because that was all you had. Whereas you went to a movie theater, you had to see what was in that movie theater. So this is the idea of a push media. Um, that changes with the advent of home video and you now have a, a pull media. This was supposed to be, of course, the death of all the other existing markets and, and, and of course it wasn't. Um, all of a sudden, whole new aftermarket in home video and a whole new form of, of, of revenue with enormous shelf space, at least as much as your, you know, your local video store, your blockbuster could, could provide. Okay, so now we flash forward to about five years ago when you, the, the, the new media and the internet um, comes along. And there you have the ability, the ultimate pull media, 24-7. Um, there's, no, there's no number that can express the number of channels that are available. It's, it's, it's downloads, it's streaming, it's, it's the convergence of not only can you, can you pull it into your TV, you can pull it into your literal hand or watch it on a bus or watch it um, in, uh, you know, while, you're, while you're pumping gas. And, and I don't know if any of you have worked on any of those shows that, 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 uh, that air at the gas station, but it's pretty compelling TV um, to watch. Um, so, 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 of course, Everybody said at the time, new media is going to kill old media. And what do we think? Of course, it did not. Uh, brand new revenues, brand new aftermarket, uh, unlimited shelf space. The, the trick and the challenge, the business challenge for creative types like us, uh, as a result of this change, is that um, the conglomerates don't own all this stuff yet. Um, there's, a, there's a fabulous book that I recommend you all read um, called The Master Switch by a professor at Columbia called, uh, named Tim, Timothy Wu. 
And it talks about the history of media in the 20th century. And in each case, going back to the telegraph, he describes how it goes from a literal you know, invention in somebody's backyard or laboratory to the next big thing that everybody, every farmer in America will own a radio transmitter, he tells the story. And it goes from, from, from that to a single company uh, or, or oligopoly controlling every aspect of that particular medium. And he, of course, expresses great disdain for the possibility that that will also happen um, with the Internet. So here we have this, this great new frontier in the Internet with the ability to... Um, um, for any individual to upload, to create content, because the barriers to entry there have come down for production. And the trick is a story that Francis Coppola told years and years ago that he said that the, the next, the, the next, he wasn't going to make the next Godfather. It was going to be made by some little girl with a video camera that she found in the street in Calcutta. And I, I don't know that Calcutta had a lot of video cameras lying in the street, but, but his sense was that this was a, a you know, me, the future of media was going to be made by. Um, civilians and not not uh, uh, you know th not the industry, and and yet his th the punchline was of course. But how are you going to get it distributed? How are you going to get people to to watch this this great work of art? And and we now have that answer um, in the uh, in the internet. The trick remains. The challenge remains that there are these same six companies out there, and this is where the the Comcast NBC Universal merger is so. Uh, critical to the life force of the internet that 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 it that it was allowed to happen because you have the company that owns the pipes, namely Comcast, merging with the company the companies that that produce the content, and it's that um, that's the direction in which all of media tends tends to go. Um, that's a step in the in that direction. The rules to limit uh, internet neutrality. And the, the open internet, all of those, the, leg, the legislation and the rules coming out of the FCC, which so far have been good, not great, all of that is a move in that direction. Um, there, was, there was a piece of legislation that uh, you probably heard about called SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, that was, uh, uh, that was, that was literally shot down by, uh, thanks to Wikipedia and, uh, and Google uh, about a month ago, it's all that was another step in the direction of of that consolidation. Um, so the, this is the current challenge in in television. Back in the day, um, you had people like Norman Lear or or Stephen J. Cannell or uh, uh, Marcy Carson, Tom Werner, who not only produced television, did the show part of the show, but also owned it. And as a result, um, they controlled cradle to grave and were able to shop around with the Cosby Show or Roseanne or, or All in the Family and, and place it wherever they could get the best deals for themselves and for the creative talent in the show. With the limitation and the consolidation in media and the limited number of, of traditional media outlets that will distribute, um, that has gone away. And as a result, there are very, very few, if any, Individuals who are not only the, not the owners of the copyright, but the the owners of the of the uh, uh, of the rights to reuse, distribute, and 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 own. And this was all without going into the details. This is all the results of the repeal of the FinCEN uh, financial syndication regulations of the of the 80s, um, which which therefore leaves us with the challenge: that the only place that you can still make and own and distribute. Your content is the is the internet, and so you know YouTube and and uh, uh, iTunes, Hulu, Netflix, Roku, whatever Soviet era typo you're you're broadcasting on. You, you've got you've got the web creators out there who are the you know they are the 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 Gutenberg, Shakespeare's, Franklin's, Marconi's, Farnsworth, and Chayefsky's all rolled into one, and. It is my opinion that it is these good shakes, Frank and Werthyshevskys, who are out there making uh, and living up to the future challenge of television, which is not only getting people to watch it, but also getting people to pay for it. Thanks, and let's talk some more. All right, that set, certainly sets the, sets the stage for the conversation. Um, Patrick, um, you know, one one thing about that uh, 
about the internet, uh, and then I think someone from Intel later on today will be talking about about this. Is you know, there's in with the internet and the explosion and the the low barrier to to producing content. What what challenges as as like a Writers Guild member um, are you, do you see for the membership that um, there will be when we are suddenly the consumer will have access to theoretically I mean I think there's been statements by 2015 over 500 million hours of content for every single individual how, how are we going to get through the cat videos and and uh, for Charlie the good creative family. you know the, the quality creative work I think that is that is the challenge and and you know to a certain extent the um, without going into the, the gory details of it, I mean, that's what the, the strike in 2007, 2008 was about, was that the, the assuming that the same companies that control old media would move into new media and, as I say, have the leg up in terms of being able to produce stuff. I mean, the average, you know, the average guy with his dog on a skateboard can't get Tom Cruise to appear in that particular uh, video typically, um, whereas Warner Brothers can, and and so there's this, the 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 dynamic shifts from simply being able to make it to being able to make people watch it, and and that's where um, the sort of entrepreneurial spirit of the of the creative um, the creative team comes into play, and and you know. Not speaking on behalf of all writers, but I think a fair number of us are are used to the idea of here's here's the art, here's the craft, here's the business. Let somebody else deal with the actual, you know, the show and the business. Let somebody else deal with that. And so for us to to have to move into a new realm where we are both the creator and figuring out how to how to pay for it and how to distribute it and how to exhibit it with you know with the kinds of ratings you need to to support that lifestyle, it's, if I knew the answer to that, I would not be sitting here this morning, right. I would be out doing it. Well, well maybe Bill does. Um, Bill, you've, you've, uh, you've been at this for a while and, and moved up here to Portland and so probably have a little bit of a removed perspective, but I mean, how, how have you seen your career, um, has, has it changed since you first started in terms of, in terms of how you approach your own creative development? Um, are there new things that you are rethinking in terms of your own development process? I guess it all, you know, to s sound extremely mercenary, it all does boil down to money. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're talking about here. Most people don't make television for free or for fun. You know, people do that when they're 22 and they put up, uh, you know, w they put up videos on YouTube or whatnot, but after a while it gets old. Uh, you know, uh, a good example would be those guys from South Park who made those, those videos for fun. People were passing them around and then they figure out a way to monetize it and build an empire. Um, so, uh, in answer to your question, it's for me, it's still pretty much the same way as it was in the 90s in that I am, am regularly employed by one of those six media giants. Uh, and, you know, at any given time, I'm employed by three or four of them on three or four different projects, but I still haven't. And, and frankly, I don't, ha I know I, I would kind of like to devote a lot of time to making something great for the internet, but really that's time I could be making money, you know? <laughs> and so, if I, if I spent hours and hours and weeks and weeks crafting a hilarious thing on, uh, for YouTube, they got 100,000 views, I would be out that money. I probably should have devoted that creative energy to coming up with something I could have gotten paid for. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm but, sorry but to put it so bluntly, but honestly, that's really the case. We're talking about a business. And I, and I don't want it to seem like we disagree uh, in, in that regard. I, I do, however, and... Bill and I have, have worked on the kinds of projects together that are designed to break that business model. And it, while I'm saying I think that it's not likely to happen soon, I do think that there's ultimately going to be some kind of breakthrough um, that makes uh, the, the that, that breaks through the noise. Now, it it may it, it may end up just being an incubator project. In other words, something that 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 gets made, gets attention, people watch it, and then it gets bought by, by Sony or gets bought by, by Viacom and becomes a traditional television show. The, the, the Fred uh, 
that uh, that exactly. series well, on. Exactly. That's on the ultimate. Almost all of those things, like you're talking about, ultimately get bought by one of those six conglomerates and turned into a. a Machine. Right, and, and you know that's that's actually something I want to touch on with Portlandia, and David could probably speak to this because, in some ways, Portlandia started as an incubator um, on Facebook. It was it Facebook or it had its own website? Um, uh, it, it was its own uh, website. The Th Thunder Ant videos, which were just experiments. Uh, Carrie Brownstein and Fred Armisen were friends, and uh, they would get together and make these videos that were often shot with a camcorder and. Uh, um, uh, and a little more than uh, other of their uh, celebrity uh, friends coming with them. And then that uh, uh, eventually was brought to the attention of uh, <coughs> uh, Lauren Michaels' production company, and they uh, started shopping around. They talked about how they might develop it into a show, and they should start shopping around. So there's sort of a, an interesting irony that, that you know, the, if you're working in the new media, basically a web series, the, the reward at the end of the day for making that is to get an old media deal called a TV show. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, if I can comment on the, the business model, there, are, there is the possibility, I think, uh, if you look to the, the music industry, there's a possibility for some disruption in the system. iTunes, I believe, was the disruption in the old media um, uh, uh, monopolies, and what happened is what's hap what seems to be happening now, uh, uh, and I, I think it's still a little too early to tell. Is that there was a shift, and um, small labels are now doing pretty well, and um, uh, and I think uh, we do better as consumers. There's better choices for us in the music business, and um, even though there aren't the the mega hits, uh, not every um, and not every uh, uh, musician with a hit song can destroy their hotel room and um, <laughs> and still keep going. But 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 there are, but there are many many more. I would argue many many more working musicians and talent than there were under the old uh, monopoly system. So my sort of hope, uh, and I don't know, I have no evidence to will this out. But my sort of hope is that there'll be some kind of disruption, uh, a technological disruption that makes it possible for the, um, the system to change a little bit so uh, as a consumer we'll get more quality product and uh, uh, the people who actually create that will get more credit for doing it. Um, you know, with, with Portlandia being a, an interesting case in that, like, they really kind of decided they're going to appeal to niche and go lower budget and, and stick to that. Do you, do you guys, and, and also, you know, a much nimbler, smaller staff. I mean, in the case of Portlandia, they, they stretched to have a third writer on the show, um, whereas on, I don't know what, Carson or some of the other cartoons where there's multiple. Do you, do you see that being more of a focus of, like, really smaller groups of te teams creating smaller content, or do you think there still will be that need for large staff you know, multiple writer. You know, there's the 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 way television is produced, as in the traditional 22 episodes per year format for broadcast, or if you're on a late night show where you're doing four or five a week, you you tend to need a large staff of writers because it's it's a number one, it's a collaborative process where not everybody can crank out. And not everybody is firing on all on all pistons every hour of the day, and and it's, I mean, it's been described as a golden sweatshop because it does take a lot of people a lot of time to do what's often <laughs> doesn't seem like it's necessarily a lot of work, but but it is, and and so the move from uh, from that broadcast model to the cable model, and and perfectly. Um, Indicated by a show like Futurama, which when 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 it was on Fox, we had were there 14, 15 of us at at its height, and certainly The Simpsons, which still has 22, 23 writers uh, on on the staff, as as opposed to the way Futurama is now produced for cable, 13 episodes air every year. There's there's eight of us, 
and, and the assembly line process of broadcast television isn't as rigorous, therefore doesn't require, um, whether or not it requires it, I'll say it doesn't, it doesn't sustain financially the ability to have that large of a creative uh, staff. The cast is the same, you can't change that. Um, you still need the same number of people uh, animating because you didn't, you didn't change that. The, the only other place that really those kind of costs have been cut have been in, in, in music creation, which, which I think The Simpsons is now the, the only remaining television show. It used to be normal to do the show with a full orchestra scoring uh, every episode, and that was the case for Futurama on broadcast. On cable, we now have Christopher Ting, the music director, and his synthesizer. And that's the entire uh, music budget is is uh, uh, is so so the 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 again the change that comes with the challenge is moving from you know fitting fitting the square peg into into the round hole of what um, what the cost model will sustain. Bill. Uh have in, in as you've been pitching, you know, constantly out there pitching projects. Are you seeing a shift in terms of what, you know? I, I think we've, we've we've spoken before, and the the underlings in the network business are looking for in terms of, you know, uh, my my most generic example is uh, the 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 Twitter feed shit. My dad says became a, a television show because it, it aggregated a big following. Is that <coughs> being discussed in in the rooms as far as? things that have been proven? Well, every place has a, a specific brand. Uh, and you're talking again about what, how many outlets are there for television? Four, 35, 40 prescripted television, maybe? Uh, you know, from IFC to ABC to whatever, to USA. Everyone has a different brand, you know? Um, and they're all, the underlings are instructed, well, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for, you know, light, airy, fun cop shows, in the case of USA, you know? Or we're looking for quirky, offbeat, comedies in the case of IFC. And each one of those has an audience <clears throat> of, of a varying size, and therefore that affects what they're willing to pay. If you can go create a show, the perfect example of a show that hits on all cylinders, I guess, would be Modern Family, at least in comedy. On ABC, it, appeal, it has huge ratings. Uh, it appeals across the board. It appeals to kids, it appeals to adults. It has a large potential audience because it's about family, which pretty much everyone has to some extent. Uh, if you're talking about a show like Portlandia, where it's kind of about satirizing the foibles of hips, urban hipsters, that's a much smaller audience, and it's uh, therefore that affects what they're willing to pay for such a show. Uh, if you can, if the ultimate thing in television is creating a show that appeals to a broad audience, and therefore, and that affects, if you, you can come up with something like that, you know, you can retire. You can write your own ticket and then retire. That's you know, that's the ultimate goal. Of people who create television shows is to do something like that, I think. But uh, it, you know, there's a limited number of places for that type of thing. Right? Is 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 the audience still open to? I mean, yeah, there are examples like Modern Family and and, and several of the reality shows. Is the audience, do you think? And this is for anybody in the in the panel. Um, open to the, that broad appeal show, or or do you think that the audience now is is gearing on? Uh, niche programming or things that they can specifically become really passionate about, um, you know, in the case of, well, um, I don't know, uh, well, one one in particular, um, the, uh, Supernatural, where there's like this fan, fan interaction. Um, do you think that's becoming the development or do you think there always will be broad audience appeal direction? Anyone want to? Well, I think we're going to see because they have to, I think we're going to see um, a lot of niche. We're going to see more niche programming or n niche broadcast. I love the term. Uh, but I, I think that's just a reflection of the same reality that um, all media is going through, which is, um, I mean, even in the case of a very broadly watched show that's a hit like Modern Family, the, the total numbers of people watching that don't come near what a show would have been cut f because it didn't have a big enough audience a decade ago. And there obviously are a lot more eyeballs than there used to be. So, so I, I don't think we're going to go away from that idea of niche broadcasts entirely, but I think they're always hoping for more. Um, in a certain way, that almost might be the, the 
executive, the network executive excuse, I never expected more people to watch this than this amount of people. Uh, even though they're, they're, you know, obviously uh, the basis of their return on investment is numbers of people watching. So the broader, the better, I think. The, we're, we are seeing more and more from more of a marketing and promotion side about fan engagement um, on shows like Supernatural. I, I'm guessing Simpsons to some extent maybe does some fan engagement. Um, yeah, but I think Simpsons is a strange holdover from this, from the 90s, from another era, which was the Big Tent era, you know, and everybody knows. It, it's, I think it's its own unique animal in that respect. Do you, does, does that notion of, of fan engagement get brought in in the, in the development process um, at all, or does it, it focus on the... It does. I mean, I think, what, just to go back to what you were saying a second ago, I think there is, there are, a, to put it extreme, in very broad strokes, there are two markets. There's the mass market and there's the niche market. And it's, I think that's the same, and not just in television, it's in every business. It's in every, look at books, you know, look at the books you see in the airport by Tom Clancy and whatnot. That's mass appeal, but you know, you go to Powell's to one, you know, to the back corners, and you can find little poetry volumes and whatnot, and that's niche. There's not very much money in the niche market, but there's passion, and in the broad market, there's oodles and oodles of money for Tom Clancy and so forth, you know. And I think that there's a market for both of those things. How do the guilds and unions that represent the talents, and I'll bring Nathaniel finally into the conversation, address that? Um, how can, you know, I'm. I, it seems even within the broadcast <coughs> networks, they're beginning to consider niche programming on, on certain nights. But I mean, how, how do you, from representing the creative talent, acknowledge that there are some things that are going to be niche and some things that are going to be mass appeal? I mean, I actually think that the tension and the challenge that is presented to creative types and definitely professional performers is between an internet that is pushing a lot more of amateur video making. So the next person that makes a new uh, commercial could do that on an iPhone. That on one side, and on the other side, those who control the content and the delivery of the content and how they're willing to make it accessible to consumers. Uh, I really see that consumers want uh, entertainment that it, at a rapid delivery, high quality, uh, and with an ease of payment. And when they don't receive that, they end up you know, essentially using BitTorrent or peer-to-peer -peer file network program um, so that they can get their content in a really easy to get manner. So I think professional creative types are kind of stuck between this rock and a hard place right now. Um, and going, going with more niche uh, programming, I think, is a way to kind of address that. Um, but really, those who create a lot of um, a lot of this content don't end up controlling how the content is delivered to people, uh, and I think that's where a lot of the challenges are. Patrick, I, I just want to add that I mean I do think that I agree with with Bill that the niche and the uh, larger audience it's always it's always side by side, but now because of the 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 infinite shelf space, you have the ability to create much more niche programming and and where the paradigm shift I think will come from or at least is coming from right now is a show like Arrested Development being put on Netflix that here was a show that you know it, it didn't make it I mean, it, it had a level of success in the broad arena but it it stayed on the air and it continued to have a life after production because of a niche fan base. And as a result, they were able to find the, the overlap in the Venn diagram of the enough people who would watch and support a business model for making more episodes. And that, that became Netflix. Um, and I think we're going to see more of what... Um, more of what I think Netflix is trying to do, basically, to keep its head above water, which is create uh, create content, new content, because it, it's it's finding it harder and harder to to reuse and and to distribute to stream. Uh, they just lost the deal with with stars that allowed them to to stream Disney movies. So so you 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 now they've got to fill, even though it's infinite, they've got to fill their shelf space with something that keeps people um, subscribing every month. And so the assumption is that things like Lilyhammer and, and uh, um, uh, 
uh, Arrested Development, and there's another one I can't. Oh, uh, House of Cards. That that's that's going to be where. I mean, it's it's it looks like traditional media. It it looks high budget, and but it's but it is more of a niche um, uh, product. Yeah, Netflix is clearly, uh, like you said, in order to keep its head above water, creating. Uh, and, and even YouTube to some extent now with their with their recent their brand, yeah. Um, do we need to now group YouTube and Netflix and Amazon in as television, um, or or does the word television almost become a moot point here in the next couple of years because it's it's all just basically screen based? You know my my kids, uh, <laughs> we we watch web videos on a seventy inch screen. And my son told me he watched Lawrence of Arabia on his iPhone. <laughs> this is wrong, right? <laughs> and yet, this is where we're going. So I, I think the notion of a, a, a video, a televisual, um, I, don't, I don't know that there will be a difference between um, what you can do with your handheld device as a camera and and uh, a, a, a widescreen motion picture. I think there also is, uh, in terms of the broad audience thing, there's, a, there's always going to be a large number of people, especially in America, who don't want to have to go to a lot of trouble to track down what they want to watch. They just want to veg out, they want to turn on the TV and have stuff blasted at them. And that's, that's what CBS is great at, you know? And, <laughs> they, and it's, I, I don't think people, not everybody wants to sit uh, and scroll through Netflix menus and say, oh, I want to track down this old episode of Bewitched. They just want to turn on TV and see what's new tonight. And that's why uh, broadcast television, I think, will be around for a long time. It may, it, also because of sports, frankly, and the NFL. I mean, the Super Bowl is not going to be on YouTube. I don't think it's going to be, I mean, there's such an immense amount of money to be made and there's so many eyeballs and it has such a ripple effect on other programming that major sports, I think, are going to keep the networks alive for a long time, even if the rest of the stuff they broadcast is reality shows or whatnot. I do think that the, the I agree with that, and, but I also agree that there's a burgeoning market in the, the ancillary stuff that comes out of NFL.com. And, and similarly, I just had the experience of racing home to watch the Oscars because we weren't going to get there in time. My, my son again said, you know, we can actually watch it through streaming on, you know, on, on my phone. And, and again, not the same experience, but under certain circumstances, the, the you know, the, again, it's the, the old push media of, of broadcast is, is, is having to adapt itself into the new pull media and and I think that's that's inevitable and it's not you know if if, if I could again if I could predict how it was going to happen I, I wouldn't be sitting here today uh, switching over to actual the producing of, of television content um, certainly there's been a pretty broad shift in both features and television be outside of Los Angeles and and David uh, you've I guess have somewhat benefited from that and that now um, because of various digital technologies or, or film incentives, um, suddenly production has, has evolved outside of Los Angeles. Um, how has that affected places like Oregon or, or other, other states? Um, and, and where do you see that continuing to go? Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, a decade ago, if you, if you didn't have the right area code uh, on your attach your phone number, there was certainly um, some skepticism of, to your abilities, and I think that's changing a little bit. Um, but it's still there's there isn't really a substitute for the company towns, the the places where um, all the resources are kind of at your fingertips. So I think New York and Los Angeles and um, Vancouver, BC aren't in danger of losing their predominant status exactly. But I think it is, as everything else, it's more diffuse and people are more willing to uh, uh, accept uh, folks who are uh, living and working in, in other places. And Portland happens to be a particularly good place. I'd say there is about a dozen places in the country that are thought of as, as um, uh, kind of high caliber production centers. And we're uh, probably the tiniest of those places. So. And you, you've actually used that to your advantage on, on Portlandia in terms of 
your approach from commercial production, and, and a lot of it's using digital cameras and <coughs> convincing crews and, and uh, you know, labor to adapt to what's at your fingertips. Somewhat. I mean, uh, I think that uh, the budget was the, was the real driving force, but also the, the director and, um, and Fred and Carrie and the writers all sort of, they agreed that their ambition was outsized of the budget. So we sat around and tried to think about ways that we could give them what they wanted creatively. And the, the indie film approach seemed to be the, the, the way to do it. Um, it it's, um, it's very possible to do here. Uh, the kind of show that it is makes it possible. The idea that a lot of it is improvised. But we're a very odd show. Like even in the, when we approach the various guilds and unions, uh, trying to, we don't fit, we appear to not fit into any of their categories. We're a multi, multi-camera show, but we shoot on location, not in a studio. So that creates a lot of challenges for us, especially uh, in terms of uh, guilds and unions. But we, everyone has been um, e pretty friendly to the show. I think there's um, uh, a notion that uh, things are, cha are changing and going to change in the way that we're going. Uh, but they, there's reluctance to cede a lot of ground because uh, I think uh, a lot of what we've been talking about is you see the conglomerates getting richer and richer and then uh, labor and guilds are being asked to uh, provide more and more concessions and there's a disconnect there. Um, certainly in front of them they can see that not as many people are going to watch Portlandia as watch Modern Family so they shouldn't be charged the same to do it but at the same time there really is this feeling that there's some um, a kind of an oppression so uh, <clears throat> so there's there it's it's a negotiation I'll say that you know I want to add because this answers the question that, that I didn't answer earlier from Vince asking about what the guilds and unions have to do to deal with this kind of new media and 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 a lot of it has to do with what you just suggested that that you're independent you're basically a startup you're genuinely looking to do something that that is competitive for the same eyeballs that the big six are out there um, with with the advantages that they have and it's in the interest I believe at least of the of, of the guilds in and unions in Hollywood to encourage that kind of independent production because along with that consolidation that's happened over the past 20 years has been a, a, a real, real coordination among those six companies in terms of, of, of their ability to bargain. I mean, the, the whole idea of, of what's called in, in labor pattern bargaining, if you think of how the, the United Auto Workers work, they get all the crafts together and they find one company and bargain a contract with them and if they can't make the deal, they strike them and, or they move on to the next one. Whereas in, that, in the entertainment industry, you've got these six multinational conglomerates who bargain together and find the union that, that needs the deal quickest or that makes the, uh, uh, the that, that typically is more collaborative and, and you make the deal with them and they move on to the next union or guild. And so for us, uh, and, and again, this is again part of what we struck for in 2007, trying to develop a, a, an alternative bargaining partner to these, to this, uh, this alliance that exists is 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 fundamental to our ability to gain to gain leverage on the part of, of our members. So so it's you know it's 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 in our interest, it's in the guild's interest to to not only negotiate but to to encourage that kind of. Uh, uh, and I, I know sometimes that does, it doesn't come across that way. I'm sure Nathaniel can tell stories about uh, trying to bargain these small contracts with genuinely small producers, but it is. Uh, uh, it is, I do believe it's ultimately in everybody's best interest. Well, speaking of collaboration, I mean, I think the next big thing in, in labor is, is SAG-AFTRA and becoming one union, and will that happen? It's been talked about for years and years, and, um, you know, in, until very recently, there were probably very, well, there were, there were lines, definite lines between what SAG did and what AFTRA did, but... Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, definitely as employers have been consolidating, um, 
and they, they do everything um, across entertainment, um, these six employers. Um, the need to consolidate the labor movement also exists in order to um, keep our bargaining strength. It used to be that if something was done on film, it would be Screen Actors Guild, and if something was done on tape, it would be AFTRA. Um, well, I don't think really much of anything is done on film or tape anymore. Um, most everything is done digitally. Uh, and so for labor to keep any kind of power, um, Screen Actors Guild absolutely has to unite with AFTRA and become one union so that um, the actors that we represent have the strongest possible voice at the bargaining table. Uh, and, and these, the content owners and those who, who provide it are making a, a lot of money, especially uh, when it comes to cable television. Um, and a, a lot of what we've seen with new media is a pressure to deteriorate the actual rates that people get paid. And it's not just performers, but it's crew uh, and, it's, and it's creative types who, um, who put in uh, sweat and tears into these programs. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on, on them to do it for cheaper, while those who are actually creating uh, or uh, controlling the content and delivering it are making a lot of money. Uh, and so I think labor has to definitely unite uh, and, and, and stand together in order to, to bargain at the table um, with a strong position. Uh, before we get too much further, I mean, it, I'm certainly open to questions from the audience. Does anyone have one? Uh, Vince, one, one point I'd make. It, it may be coincidence, but uh, SAG and AFTRA have been talking about getting together for years and years and years, and since Nathaniel's been there for only one year, suddenly we seem closer <laughs> to it. <laughs> Maybe coincidence. Thank you, David. You might give the Portland chapter a little too much credit on that, but um, are there any questions? Or we can LA. certainly keep it going. I'm Graham Turner from the University of Queensland. That uh, I'm interested in, in the problem of, of choice, what you were talking about, you know, that there are people who actually don't want a lot of choice. They simply want stuff thrown at them and it, obviously there are a lot of a lot of them and I'm wondering just how much the industry is worried about about choice fatigue about simply the, the problem of, of managing choice I, I spent four months in the US a year or two ago it was the first time I'd had a television with a premium package on it rather than being in a hotel so it was it was bliss but it also was chaotic and I actually needed help from I got it from my students about <laughs> how to choose what I wanted to watch and I wondered just how much concern there is about the proliferation of choice and the continual expansion of choice in the search for more content and, and, and how much the industry is thinking about how you actually manage that, how you actually organise that material in ways that you're going to attract viewers. Uh, the short answer is yes. I believe that the, the, the major media outlets are, are desperately afraid of that because obviously greater choice means that they might lose the, the hooks that they have into, into viewerships. But, but um, from the perspective of, of a talent creator, um, I, I certainly think, again, I, I, what do I know? I looked at what my children watch on TV, and they seem to somehow find the things that, in which they're interested. And I think the, the overlap between social media and new media is is a big help, or at least it's it's a catalyst towards. I think I think people like it or not fall into demographic groups that that they one thing leads to another in terms of, of what you watch and what you enjoy watching. What what are um, you know what what I probably haven't watched a, a new television show for entertainment reasons in, in years because I end up having to watch things because people in my office have watched them and I need to be able to be socially integrated with them so I have to talk about you know, what uh, The Walking Dead, um, which I otherwise wouldn't watch. Whereas, and, and, I, and I think that kind of uh, social, social mediaization of of, of television is something that that you know gives. I think that's the direction which people are going to find new programming, and so that is scary to the to the establishment. But I think it's encouraging to the uh, to the to the futurists. Um, can I switch from moderator to giving an opinion about that real quick? Is um, I think one thing that is changing, whether the networks ad admit it or not, are um, the ones that are successful are choosing for you. Um, 
and you're seeing that in, in basic cable where they're going to pick a time of the year to launch shows that they really care about. Um, you know, Walking Dead, perfect example. That was AMC, and that was their brand. And I, I think even in some of the networks, you're starting to see that a little bit. With um, NBC, put all their eggs in the bath in their basket of Smash and and The Voice. Whereas a few years ago, everybody premiered in the fall, and you just threw it all out there. But it seems like there's a shift uh, coming from um, working at Showtime. I mean, it was a definite shift for us in that we went from just throwing it out there as much as we can as possible as opposed to choosing what we really cared about and picking, okay, the fall is Dexter, the, the, the spring is the Tudors. And I, I think those people that are making those decisions are having more success connecting with audiences. Well, <clears throat> I think the sort of short answer to that is marketing, and I don't think it's particularly good for us as consumers. I, you're seeing this in all, uh, we, see, we, we definitely see it in uh, the American independent independent film, it's a problem. Like, it, they know they need to create the audience. That's the problem. So uh, if they have to put a lot of resources, uh, and typically old money resources, into convincing mass audiences to watch a show, that leaves them with less resources to make shows. So I think what we're seeing is um, a temporary time now, because there aren't uh, enough aggregators of material where uh, we'll move increasingly to the, in the broadcast, um, uh, lots and lots of effort in marketing to convince you that this is a show you need to see or a film that you need to see. Uh, and then uh, in some time, as we find aggregators that we trust who share our aesthetics and opinions, the, that marketing will be less and less useful. Again, I'd, I'd, I'd point to the the recording industry to sort of show the way. Um, you would put all your uh, marketing efforts into one or two artists, Madonna or Britney Spears, and that would pay for the, the rest of your development. And now I don't think that's the, the way it works. I think now that there's lots of successful small labels like Kill Rock Stars and, and uh, so forth that are, that are, are funding those artists for the correctly to the size of their market. And, and by the way, the technology itself is helpful. I mean, the, the, I don't know when Mad Men is on, but TiVo does. And so it, it records it for me. And in the pull media environment, you not only are told when you have bought something or rented something that you've got it, but here are things that other people like you also like. And, and as a result, there's, there's a, a whole other realm of, of ways for you to learn about new, uh, new content. I, Here's another question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I think when we talk about choices, it's important to remember that we're not just talking about the choices of the kinds of content that people watch, um, but consumers right now have a lot of choices as far as how they get the content that they watch. And I think it's really important to remember that um, I watch a lot of television. I don't have cable, and I don't get television reception in my home. I watch it all on the Internet. I watch it through my PlayStation. I think more and more consumers are looking to get their content in a way that is not the traditional uh, ways that they used to uh, before. And I think those that control the content need to keep up with consumers uh, in order to keep the market share. I think that uh, the music industry has kind of had to shift and adapt and adjust um, after Napster, and I think iTunes has helped them do that. I think Netflix is kind of leading the way as far as the visual mediums are concerned um, with getting that content to consumers in a way that they want it. Uh, and I think they, they need to keep adapting in that manner for everyone in between in order to keep, keep us all making money and keep us all employed. Okay, right there in the back. You've got the I've mic. got the mic, yeah. Uh, this is a question for Patrick and Nathaniel to bat around and perhaps others as well. Um, and I'll, I'll start with uh, asking Patrick how many writers in the Guild make more than pick a number, $100,000 a year, maybe lower than that. Uh, and then back to the strike, um, it took an enormous toll on the Los Angeles and Hollywood area, uh, huge financial losses. Uh, and after came in with a lot of pressure to, to settle this strike. And, and I, my, the question is really about the relation between below the line and the people that we keep calling creators. And, and I wonder if there's some, uh, you know, the SAG-AFTRA combination will probably take some of that tension away. 
but it strikes me that there are a few people making a lot of money, as they always have. Now, the fact that they're not going to own those shows anymore simply means that Seinfeld is not going to make $500 million. He might make $10, $15, 20000000 million, which for most of us in this room is not a bad gig. And, and I think that, you know, that, that the uh, – and it does go back to fence in, and once that was changed, it was over. So the, the big money. So where is, you know, where are the concerns in the creative community uh, for below the line and, and not just below the line in the industry, but, I mean, there were people in Los Angeles who, you know, cooks, or people who weren't associated with anything who got hit. Uh, the, the average Writers Guild salary uh, is about $86,000, which is a high salary, no doubt. Um, that's the average salary of someone who's actually working. Um, our uh, membership was uh, very concerned and continue to be concerned. It's one of the things that makes a strike as extraordinarily difficult a decision to reach as we did, um, that there are colleagues and friends and spouses and children and parents who are affected by it. Um, that was something that seemed not to be of concern to management um, it, other than to say, well, the Guild doesn't care about the below-the-line talent, uh, whereas we do, and yet they refused to negotiate, and we continued to demand or, or ask for negotiations, and so for weeks, if not months, um, people were out of work because of the inability to make a deal that we ultimately did uh, make. Um, the below-the-line talent in Hollywood is represented by uh, uh, two very powerful unions, the Teamsters, their local 399, and the IATSE, um, which is, uh, um, ha has, I think, 12 different crafts uh, that include just about everybody. Uh, the, the current challenge for those unions is actually uh, organizing and making sure that the work that's done in in Hollywood is actually done under their agreements because these same companies that are uh, intent on making it seem like we're putting people out of work are doing their level best to produce television and feature films without union deals for uh, the IATSE members and, and the Teamsters. And I think that's the real challenge is getting, um, getting their uh, members uh, not only maintaining employment, but also getting them the, the, the contracts and the benefits that, they, uh, that they've historically gotten in a, in a densely unionized business. I definitely think that um, organizing is, is the key. Uh, and we've seen AFTRA and Screen Actors Guild both have more of a service union model um, for a long, long time. And by that, by service union model, what I mean is we administer contract, we bargain on behalf of our members, uh, we go to the bargaining table, uh, we get the contract, we provide that to members and we administer it for them and on their behalf. Uh, and in the case of Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA, we also um, you know, help our members figure out how their contributions for health care and retirement are going into a fund and how that fund is then administered. That, those are all services. Um, as the industry has been changing, uh, we've definitely been needing to move to a more organizing model. That is identifying work that is happening um, and then connecting with those who work on those projects, um, whether it's performers or, or crew, we have to organize into this new era uh, in order to keep uh, a market share and, and union density and, and protections for workers as far as wages and working conditions. Hi, um, Priscilla Ovaya at the University of Oregon. Thank you for a really interesting panel. I wanted to ask this question. As somebody who's really invested in the intersection of theory and practice and how those things come together, I appreciate you being a part of this conversation and, and helping us think through some of these things. Um, what I'm hearing is really the tension of, um, or, or what it means to have a business of creativity, right? I mean, people developing things, whether it's as writers or performers or, or below the line, above the line, the, the business models that allow us to be creative people um, in this kind of format just kind of changes the sphere. So I wanted to ask the question in terms of genre and to think about maybe the way that comedy, is comedy a potential space where some of these new models might be 
more possible to test out in terms of distributing online or in terms of the, the way that things are written? Is there any special role that comedy or, or other genres, but I'm thinking of that given our panel here, might help us, I don't know, do you have any perspectives on the role that comedy plays at this moment? Uh, I think com it's my observation that comedy is is, the, is an ultimate niche kind of thing. You can go super niche with it, and that's what Adult Swim is. Frankly, Adult Swim, and especially shows that were on Adult Swim, like Tim and Eric's awesome show, and things like that are comedy, comedy for people who uh, have kind of twisted senses of humor or are like comedy nerds or whatever. It's like, you know, the graduate school of bizarre comedy there. And I think, <laughs> now those shows are made for $30,000 a piece, you know, as opposed to, for instance, Modern Family, which probably is $3 million an episode or something like that. And so like, there, there's a ton of opportunity, both online and in cable, for doing niche comedy. And, um, but again, niche comedy is kind of a thing that my guess is, you know, people who are working at Adult Swim, and in fact I know this because I know many of them, eventually are getting tired of working for thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> and they're they don't have residuals and they're not unionized. And then finally when they start having kids and they want health insurance, they're like, Why am I doing this? Uh, and that's the way I think that's the way a lot of uh, people in the in show business and probably in other businesses like video games and things like that are as well. The the thin end of the wedge, at least in the history of T V and radio, has always been comedy variety typically because you can do it quick and cheap and and with uh, w without having to worry about the 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 arc of characters and without having to worry about long-term story uh, developments conversely if you look at what you know, the other the other genre that that sort of in, inspires creativity or at least in the history of TV and radio has been the daytime soap which is which is almost universally dramatic I don't think there's ever been a funny line in a soap opera. <laughs> Not intentionally. Yeah. Um, sorry, my, my friends who write daytime who are watching this on streaming, I apologize. Um, but, I, but I do think that there's, uh, there's, there's a lot to be said for the fact that reality television is also not an especially funny genre, and yet because of the cost considerations, it is, uh, it, it's, it's prevailed. And so there's, you know, you have to balance the fact that, that um, I think comedy can can make a bigger splash and a bigger hit, um, um, but but long term production wise, um, dramas and 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 that kind of serialized um, dramatic programming is is actually easier and cheaper uh, to produce unless you're you know crashing a plane in the pilot of, of Lost or something and then it, then it costs you money but and, and balance that cost against what Steve Martin always said which is comedy. Comedy is not pretty, and it's not, and it's hard, and that's why comedy staffs tend to have much larger. Um, they tend to be larger than dramas, and because you know if somebody comes up with a headache, somebody else has to come in and 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 make make the funny. We have one more question, or I, I do think. Uh, sorry, but I I think that it, what a lot of what we're talking about boils down to we're in a time of great deal of technological change. Um, you know, in, in the mass of information and the internet is really sort of at the, the backbone of that. But he, I think comedy does have a special place, and, and you can go back to like what I would consider the second golden age of television commercials, television branding that started in the 80s and was was is still going on today. And and we 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 saw a gigantic migration from those television commercial messages from other types of messages to comedy. So. I think that for some reason, and I believe that it's the broad audience, and comedy is a, a, a good way to get you to a broad audience, but it's also the notion that um, branding is uh, a, a more important item. So you want people to feel good about the message and the, and the, and the purveyors of that message, and comedy is, a, is an easy answer to that. So I, I kind of think maybe yes to your question. Is this, I think we're running out of time, so this is our last question. Oh, um, just to go back to Graham, uh, Jeff Leland from University of Waikato in New Zealand, um, back to Graham's comment about choice and the fact that choice involves work on our part and time and energy and can lead to inertia. But one thing that I do think about, that I like about choice in terms of multiple platforms is the bargains that you can 
um, negotiate between you and your children or you and your students. Now, i just give examples. My daughter introduced me to Portlandia and strange Japanese TV shows. In return, I introduced her to classic Japanese cinema, Yo Yojimbo. Um, same with my son, introduced him to 2001. He interested me to, to strange uh, science fiction programs. And I, don't, I think that, that's one really good thing about delivery systems, that kind of that sharing or bargaining. I think that, uh, just to reiterate and expand upon something I said initially in this vein, I think there's at least two different ways, in, this is my opinion based on years of observation of this, there's at least two different ways in which people watch television. I think some people see it as a movie in your home, and I think other people see it as wallpaper that they just have on in the background and walk around. And that's, I think, to a large extent, those people don't, for instance, in music, it's a difference between Pandora and iTunes. When I want to listen to music, I don't want to have to sit. I don't personally don't want to find the ideal song on iTunes. I just turn on Pandora and let it tell it what I like and let it play music all day. I think uh, TV again has. There's probably at least two different. To vastly oversimplify it, there's people who watch it like they're watching a movie, and there's other people who just have it on either to chill out or it's to keep the kids calm or whatever. Do you guys know the Flight of the Concords? Yeah. I mean, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I think this has been a great panel. I, I'm sure we could go for another hour, but uh, we're out of time. Thank you.